The classical case has always been the smoke nuisance case. The electric utility puts smoke in the air, and the smoke makes my shirt dirty. That imposes costs on me. They don't have to pay me for it. And so they are imposing costs on me without my consent, and therefore the argument is that's a market failure. And so it is. It is a failure of the market. If you want to see what's involved in this, I submit to you a very simple example. Contrast the problem of a utility in driving its trucks, which have automobile accidents, with the problem in putting out smoke. Suppose I asked, you know, one of the things that people tend to talk is as if the desirable thing is to have no pollution. Now that's obviously silly. We could have no pollution in this room very quickly if everybody just stopped breathing. But the cost would be a little higher than the gain. And in the same way, suppose you asked yourself the question, what's the right number of automobile accidents for a utility to have? Now offhand, that seems like a silly question. Why, of course, it shouldn't have any automobile accidents. But maybe the only way in which the utility could avoid automobile accidents would by having its trucks never go more than three miles an hour and only between the hours of two in the morning and four in the morning when there are no other cars on the road. And that would raise the costs of producing electric power very much. It would make it necessary to raise the prices to customers. It would raise the cost of power to customers. So that's obviously silly. On the other hand, if the utility has an automobile accident until we went down the wrong road of no-fault insurance, the utility was liable to pay the damages to anybody it hurt. And therefore, if it drove its cars in such a way as to increase the number of accidents, it increased its cost, it reduced its costs of producing utilities, it increased its costs through accident payments, and it had the right incentive to have the number of accidents in which the extra cost in the form of increased liability payments just matched the extra gain from cutting its production costs. No problem arises, there's no market failure. Why? Because it's easy to identify who is hurt and who did the hurt. And so you can make it the subject of a market transaction. But when I come to the dirty shirt, which the same utility puts out, and in principle I ought to have the solution of the right amount of smoke, in the same way, the cost, the transaction costs, the costs of entering into the deal, of finding out who dirtied my shirt and of getting them to pay for me are just greater than it's worth paying for the benefit. And as it turns out, hard though it is to believe, almost all externalities or neighborhood effects arise out of these transaction costs. Now, as I say, the approach has been to regard any minor, any market failure, however minor, as a sufficient excuse for government intervention. The market has failed, therefore the government should step in. But this is a basic error, because it involves a double standard. There's not only such a thing as a market failure, there's also such a thing as a government failure. That's not unknown in the modern society. And hence, the cure may be worse than the disease. And there are two very important reasons to expect government failure to be very prominent. The first is that the very features that inhibit the market solution also inhibit government solution. If it's difficult in the market to know who has benefited or harmed whom, it's difficult for government to know who has benefited or harmed who and to put in corrective action. But a much more important reason is that government actions have laws of their own. And you and I, as well-meaning people, may say the government should step in to correct that market failure. But once we get the government into its, the act, it's going to go along according to its own rules. And those rules will mean that the ultimate results are very different than the initial intent. The will will be different than the deed. And when the government steps in and makes mistakes and has failures, they're going to be big failures and not little ones. We've had some dramatic examples that illustrate my point very quickly. Four or five years ago, the government required all producers of children nightwear to add tryst to the nightwear in order to make it flameproof. 
And lo and behold, throughout the country, every manufacturer of children's nightwear added this substance to it. Four years later, the government discovers that the chemical Tris is carcinogenic. And lo and behold, every dealer throughout the country is required to take the uh, nightwear off its shell. An example of government failure of a large scale. Again, in the early 1970s, on grounds of reducing pollution, the government required on a wide, wide scale utilities and manufacturing firms to convert from coal to oil and gas. Now the government is trying to get laws passed to require them on a large scale to convert back. So it's obvious that the fact that you have market failure is not a reason to have government to uh, call on government unless you take into account the fact that you may have government failure and that the end result may be worse than the situation you started with. Because of this possibility, it's worth re-examining, and this is a final point I really want to discuss, it's worth re-examining the existence of other ways to cope with market failure than calling in government to redress the balance. I think one of the great difficulties in discussions of this kind is a tendency to proceed as if there's only a pure market on the one hand and a pure government on the other, and to neglect the whole host of intermediate voluntary arrangements which they are, which tend to arise when there are market failures. Because after all, the existence of market failure implies a potential gain and hence gives an incentive to solve the problem. Let me give you some very simple examples. One which I owe to my son is a custom of tipping. Now, you know, it's worth stopping and thinking about the custom of tipping. There's not a person in this room who doesn't tip, even though he doesn't himself ever expect to come back to that restaurant and have that wait for serving. Why do you tip? Not for self-interest. Tipping serves a very important social function. There is a market failure here that has to be redressed. How do we have an arrangement under which people are induced to give good service? Well, the best way to do it is to make it worth their while to give good service, to, to uh, reward people who give good service, and to punish people who give bad service. But how do we do that? If you or I are going to come back to the same place time and again, it's easy. But if we're not, how do we do it? Well, we have developed a very extensive social custom for exactly this purpose, that without thinking about it, all of us act as if we were serving the interests of other people in tipping for good service. Politeness serves the same exact social function. I'll give you another very trivial and, and uh, basic example. All of us who have traveled on highways around this country have recognized the great social value of conveniently available rest facilities. Now, why on strict pre business principles should any, should any uh, gas station provide rest facilities to people who aren't going to buy gas there? He's rendering a benefit to a third party. Surely, if you were to think of market failures, you would say, well, no gas station would do that, and therefore there would be no way in which this useful social function could be provided. But in fact, it is provided, in some cases by governmental stations, but more generally, because there are national, national chains of gas stations which benefit, as they see it, from goodwill in providing these facilities. Because in other cases, the cost of enforcing payment, the co cost of restricting the use of the facilities only to those people who are going to buy gas there or pay for it is greater than the gain from doing so. And so society has developed a technique for handling this case of market failures.